title of the talk is the data function of key resources of finite field. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for returning to part two. Let me start again with the short list of constructions of K3 surfaces that we know uh, for two reasons, to come back to explain what I will do, but also because the list was incomplete. So what did we have? We had uh, equations. One can write down the K3 surface by equations. So for example, uh, maybe a complete intersection or uh, sometimes uh, with a genus one vibration. So, I don't really know any other, or hardly any other ways to write down a K3 surface by equation. Second, geometry. And I mentioned one construction already, the Coomer surface of an abelian variety. But there's another that's going to be quite relevant to uh, something I will talk about at the very end of my talk. And that is uh, moduli spaces of sheaves on K3s. So this is a way of constructing new K3 surfaces out of old K3 surfaces. It turns out that very often a moduli space of sheaves on a K3 surface is itself a K3 surface. Uh, so maybe if I have to put a name on this, it's Mukai who has studied this extensively. So third, we had the transcendental methods. Transcendental. <laughs> Uh, not, 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 yeah, so non, n certainly none of the theorems in the literature are stated in positive characteristic. But it should work and it should be relevant to what I will say, but let's say almost nothing is known. Uh, transcendental constructions and, well, one is what I talked about yesterday, that one can define a K3 surface by giving its periods. Another was mentioned is there is the twister construction that allows you to produce new holomorphic K3 surface out of a given one, again. And then the subject of today, so this is all over the complex numbers, it's over FQ, uh, Honda Tate, can we somehow prescribe a K3 surface by giving some well numbers, by giving it zeta function or something uh, of similar nature. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the zeta functions. So if x over fq is a k3, then its cohomology, uh, let's say with ZL coefficients, looks exactly the way you expect it to look after you've seen the complex picture. So there is a, a ZL in degree 0, a ZL in degree 4, a ZL to the power 22 in degree 2, and nothing in between or around it. Okay, and the well conjectures, which are a theorem here, which uh, by the line, and in fact, the line first proved the well conjectures for K3 surfaces before proving them for arbitrary varieties, says that Frobenius acts on HI. I'll, I'll now just drop all the decorations from the cohomology groups to keep the notation short, so HIQ XQL uh, with eigenvalues uh, lambda. Well, first of all, they are uh, algebraic numbers. And secondly, they satisfy that for any embedding that you choose, that their absolute value is q to the i over 2. So in our case, it's absolute value equals 1 q or q squared. OK. so. Yesterday we had this thing that, say if we have an x over c, that h2 decomposes as an algebraic part, the neuron severi group of x, and then direct sum, um, orthogonal direct sum, the transcendental lattice of x, where this thing is, well, then I should put q coefficients if I want to say direct sum, where this thing is by definition just the orthogonal complement here. Welcome. Um, and in this situation, we have a completely analogous decomposition of H2. So let me write that down as well. So we have H2, X, QL. And I'm going to shift things a bit and say, write QL1 instead of QL. Uh, this is just a normalization that will make the eigenvalues of Frobenius to have absolute value 1 instead of Q. Just divide them by Q. Makes 
the picture a bit more beautiful. So this decomposes as an algebraic part and a transcendental part, where the algebraic part is defined to be that part of the cohomology on which Frobenius acts as a root of unity. After this shift, it acts by something of absolute value 1, and that could be a root of unity. So one way of saying it is it's the union over all n of the invariance under uh, Frobenius, let me say Frobenius to the n. Everything that's invariant under some power of Frobenius. So that defines H2 algebraic and then H2 transcendental. You define it to be the orthogonal complement. OK, so uh, warning. Uh, unlike the situation yesterday, oh no, no, first an important fact. So the Tate conjecture predicts that this thing is the same as the Picard group of x. Well, tensor it with QL. And in fact, oh, I have to be careful now. In almost all cases, this is now a theorem. I'm is everything in characteristic 2 now? I think that was different Yes, so I'm. So I think it's not OK in Okay, and let's wait a little while for all the. Because these things are very delicate. <laughs> but so, known, so, refereed and verified in almost all cases, and uh, there is an announcement out that even shows this in all cases. But we won't use this in any way. This is. Uh, just to explain where the terminology algebraic and transcendental comes from. So as before, the algebraic part is the part that comes from divisors on your K3 surface X. OK, so remark, warning, it may happen that this transcendental part is actu actually vanis vanishes. So this is possible. And then you say that a K3 surface is super singular. And its Picard rank in that case will be 22. Uh, these things occur, but they will not occur in my lecture. I'll be some, whatever I was saying will be somehow orthogonal to this situation. Somebody earlier was asking, like, oh, you're going to talk about super singular K3 surfaces? Because from, in many ways, these are the most interesting in characteristic P. But from this point of view, they're going to be completely uninteresting, and everything will be perpendicular to this. Um, you'll see in a moment why. OK, so let's move on. We don't need this. For, for the, it's non-zero for the point of view from what I will talk about, yes. Um, OK, so this, please ask questions, because I'm still hoping to get uh, to the record. Of course, if you know the structure of eta cohomology, then you know the shape of the zeta function of x. So I can write that now down. So the zeta function of x over fq, it looks like uh, 1 over, there's only things in even degrees. So there is a 1 minus 2, 1 minus t coming from h0. There is a 1 minus q squared t coming from h4. And then from h2, we get two parts. And I'll denote them uh, maybe first L algebraic x comma qt times L transcendental. I'll maybe drop the x. Let me just write like this, where L algebraic is um, the kind of, I always say characteristic polynomial, but it's kind of reciprocal characteristic polynomial of Frobenius acting on the H2 algebraic, and the same for transcendental. And this extra factor Q here is to, to shift back the shift that we put in here. We kind of divided by Q uh, in passing from H2 to this H2 QL1, and now we have to multiply by <laughs> Q again. So this is purely formal. This is just a consequence of, well, of course, the computation of this cohomology is not formal. But once you know this, you know that the zeta function has this shape. Sorry. Yes. Uh, Wonderful. Uh, Yes. And then you reduce it more to a piece so that it happens to be non singular. Yes. And what happens to this decomposition into the algebraic 
the, the transcendental part can shrink and the Picard can, part can go bigger. You can have more cycles in uh, characteristic P than in characteristic zero. So this decomposition need not be horizontal, say. It can really, also, you just think of families. Also in a family, you can have specializations that have a bigger Picard rank, right? So, so this transcendental thing, even in characteristic zero, is not horizontal in families. OK, so uh, the que obvious question is now, uh, let me write it, question, uh, what are the possible ZX? And if we answer this question, then we have a kind of Honda Tate theorem in the sense that you can just specify one of these possible zeta functions and you, you know there will be uh, corresponding k 3 surface. I will not answer this question just before you get your hopes too high, but I will, I will say something non-trivial about this question. And maybe one of you will solve this question at some moment. Um, OK, what's the first thing to say? Well, I need, some, I need a lot of space somehow, but also some space I can reuse. So let me erase this again and try to write very efficiently on this blackboard. So I guess the, there's two games to play. The first is what, how much do we know about K3 surface? Everything you know about K3 surface may give you restraints on the zeta function. Like what kind of properties does this have? For example, it must satisfy the well conjectures or it must have this global shape, but maybe there are more. And then once you have a list of constraints, you have a converse problem trying to construct one uh, whenever you have something satisfying these constraints. So let me list here. So we have this, oh yeah, uh, OK. First remark. Second remark, I will now focus entirely on this transcendental part. This algebraic part is only coming back all the way at the end of the talk. You will see in a moment why. Main reason is there's not so much I can prove about it. So let me state the list of properties of this transcendental part. Yes? I, I don't even know what to conjecture in, but I'll, I'll come back to this when, I, when we're a bit further, when I can make this more precise. So, OK, so here is a long statement. Well, either this transcendental L function is 1, because we're in the super singular case, and there is simply nothing transcendental. Or it is not one, and then it has to satisfy. So let's say it's a product of one minus alpha i t, the alpha i are the eigenvalues, and then these have to satisfy a list of properties. I'll try to fit within the blackboard. Uh, let me. Sorry, I'm announcing a theorem now. So I'll write here on the wall, theorem. Um, first of all, well, the boring part. Uh, but I need to write it so that I can refer back to it. These alpha i are not roots of unity. Why? We've defined it that way. We've just uh, thrown away in everything that was a root of unity. So for no n. Secondly, these alpha i uh, satisfy the well conjecture as well, because we know the well conjectures for a k3 surface. So nothing new. You're still talking about alpha and delta, right? Yes. Yes. So L, you're right, is this clear? So L transcendental of a K3 surface over FQ either is trivial or it satisfies a list of properties I'm writing down. First is by definition. So second is by the well conjectures. Third, um, this thing is integral at primes different from P. And this is also formal as soon as you realize that you don't only have it alcohol homology with q alcohol coefficients, but actually with z alcohol. Actually, you only have it with z alcohol coefficients. That's how you make it. And Frobenius acts there. So you can compute your characteristic polynomial of Frobenius uh, with zl instead of q alcohol coefficients. 
And of course, we did this division by Q and multiplication by Q, but it doesn't do anything at the prime L. So you do have, but, but it's a weaker form of integrality, and it's coming in a moment. Because you have this shift, this division by Q, you lose something. Um, OK, so this is formal, elliptic homology. And now come the non-formal things. The Newton polygon of this L at the prime P looks like, and let me draw the picture, uh, it has at most three slopes. It can have two slopes because this thing can have length 0. And it's symmetric. So here we have h, here we have 2d minus h, and here we have 2d. Uh, and what do, we, do I need to say? Well, d is at most 10, and h is at least 1. So it has this symmetric shape. In particular, this also says that the degree of L has to be even, which is not a hard thing to prove in a different way. But here it is. It, d, it has an even degree 2d at most 20. It could be 22, but then we're in this case. Uh, and uh, this thing goes down to the valuation of 1 over q. OK, that's a lot of information. But one thing you get out of this, for example, is if you multiply your L by q, then it is, becomes actually integral at p as well. So the, maybe I'll write it here. The, ki the kind of weak integrality is that q times L is, in fact, an integral polynomial. There was a question. Yeah. So what is your definition of the polynomial? Ah. Um, no, it only looks differently because uh, uh, by this shift, it's normalized it's such that down. the, it's not upside down. It's just that uh, I actually have denominators. So that's why it goes below the axis. But it's the same definition and the same normalization. But because I did this shift, there actually will be 1 over q's uh, denominator. So actually, will, you will get negative valuations. So, sorry, what was the shift? The shift, the shift is the, 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 the state shift, ah, okay. which divides the eigenvalues by q. So somehow, if, if, I, if I, you multiply them by q again, you kind of rotate this picture. And then it starts to look like what it looked like yesterday. But it ends up at q to the. 2D here. So it really just is look at the valuations of the coefficients of your polynomials and then take the lower convex hull. Same as yesterday. Yes. Absolutely. Of over FQ bar, the geometric PCAR rank of any k3 surface over a finite field. Because if the transcendental part has even degree, it has to add up to 22. So the algebraic part also has even degree. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, basically, uh, did you use it from the function, but it's, it's not so hard to prove. You just have you, you, uh, you look at the eigenvalues of Frobenius on the transcendental part. These are not roots of unity, but they have to have absolute value q. So, so they, so they can't be q or minus q, so they come in complex conjugate pairs. And that's it. But it's a, rem it's a remarkable thing, because it means I, I really like this. In any characteristic, it means that if you have a k3 surface of fq bar, you always get one, uh, si one uh, cycle, namely just a, the, a hyperplane section, a polarization. And therefore, you need to get at least two. But it's completely mysterious where the second one comes from. No, no. With abelian varieties, you know which one to take. It's kind of, I mean, you know how to construct it. You take a graph of Frobenius somewhere. Uh, but there's no, you know it's there, but this. And you know it's there because you know the Tate conjecture, of course. No, in no other way. An interesting corollary, by the way, is that very general K3 surface, you would expect to have a one. Yeah. The PCAR rank will go up at any prime. If you have good reduction, it will jump up. Uh. Uh, 
let's move on. Because my list is not yet finished, so, so there is some kind of piadic property here, and then there is one more half piadic property. I'm going to squeeze it in. It will not play an important role, but I do want to write it because otherwise the statement is not complete. And that is this L is actually a pure power for Q, some irreducible polynomial. So it cannot be a product of distinct irreducible polynomials. And moreover, Q has a unique factor over QP of slope less than 0. So if you factor, so this picture already tells you that over QP, Q will have at least three, well, in this case, three roots. But there could be more roots, some, a slo uh, more factors, such a slope could still be a composite of several slopes. And it, this last condition is saying that this does not happen. So for negative and positive slope, there is a unique irreducible factor corresponding to this slope. I'm sorry, would you repeat the number five? Yeah. So the polynomial, so L is a pure power of an irreducible polynomial. Mm -hmm. so e, some power, Q to the E. With and this, rational with rational coefficients. Uh, L itself has rational coefficients. And moreover, this uh, L has, over QP, a unique irreducible factor of negative slope. So this, in this picture, this negative slope part does not come from two different QP polynomials. There's only one. It can occur with some power, of course, but only one QP factor occurring that contributes to this slope. Uh, no. Well, you can, it, you can put constraints. It should be a divisor of the length of this slope. So for example, if q equals p, it has to be 1. You can play all kinds of games, but in general, you cannot predict it just from the picture. So, so, so this is a long message, but reassurance, it's finished now. There's no more condition 6. What do you mean about this unique negative slope? It means that there's only one or something coefficient? Uh, no, not co so it, it means that if you factor over qp, then you get at least, in this picture, you're going to get at least three different irreducible factors because there will be a, to have to be some factor of negative slope, some of horizontal slope, and some of positive slope. But it says you don't get more than that. You can get only one irreducible factor of negative slope. Let me move on because the, the details of this last thing will not, well, they will play a role in the proof, but not in the part of the proof that I will be able to give today anyway. So. OK, so two remarks. So the first remark, this may not at all be uh, trivial at first, is the list of such L's. So given Q, there's only finitely many such L's. And in fact, they can be effectively computed, and we'll come back to that. So you, you could, in principle, say, Choose your favorite prime power q and compute the list of such functions. And people have done this. Uh, second remark. But no, because well, yeah, no, 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 because then you you still need to need to prove a converse theorem that we can't do yet. No, no. But it's reassuring, kind. Of. If the list was not finite, finite, then we had a problem. Uh, but you're running ahead, so let's. Uh, second, so this mysterious fifth property, there is this irreducibility of Q. And I won't say much about it, but it is related to or anal analogous to the irreducibility of this T of X uh, as a Hodge structure that we saw yesterday. Yesterday, we saw the transcendental part of a K3 surface over the complex numbers is an irreducible Hodge structure. This irreducibility here is some kind of piadic analog of it. Uh, OK, I should also say the proof of this is due to Artin, Mazur, uh, Noriko Yu, and Zheng Daoju, and really uses heavy machinery from piadic homology and the formal Brouwer group. And I'm not going to say anything about it today. But this is just a fact. Uh, OK, so now I, now something new, conjecture. 
and you can guess the conjecture. Uh, for every, so you fix Q, and then for every L rational polynomial satisfying properties 1 to 5, there exists a K tree x over fq such that the transcendental part of its uh, L function equals this given L. Now I can come back to your question. You all said, uh, what about the algebraic part? I don't know what, um, certainly I don't know any way of stating a precise conjecture for what possibilities for, let's say, the combination of algebraic and transcendental part occur. This is very complicated, and I don't even dare to conjecture anything. So this is why I'm. <laughs> a couple of restrictions on solving and asymptotics. Asymptotics. Um, oh, this is very hard to say. I don't know. Fifty thousand for Q equals two. <laughs> yeah, no, that's. This is hard because this is. I mean, I guess it can be done, but it's the 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 nature of the question is. Um, how many totally real polynomials with integral coefficients are there whose roots are in a given bounded interval? And I guess, I guess it can be done too, but I, I haven't done this. It's, uh... Okay, so. so but, but you, do, do you not have a reasonable conjecture which restrictions are, uh, are enough uh, for algebraic partners? But do you have at least some. Uh, Certainly, there's some. I mean, to give you an idea as to that this is non trivial. It, you can write down combinations of L transcendental and L algebraic that look completely plausible from any kind of higher motivic cohomological point of view, which looks like it's completely reasonable it should be the L function of a K3 surface. Except that then you compute the number of points of your K3 surface over, say, FQ square, and you find it's negative. And that, of course, can't happen. So, so it's very hard to really, it, it, yeah. Also, the counting problem. So, if you a priori the, the number of possibility, if the Picard rank is large, you get a huge number of possibilities. It's again a kind of very combinatorial problem for the algebraic part of the L function, and well, too many for them to reasonably occur. But and as, you, as you mentioned, you cannot have rank one. Also. 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 But let me stick to not saying anything about the algebraic part. OK, evidence for this conjecture. Well, a combination of the of the last two, right? The first three are kind of invariant, and the last two, uh, they are delicate. They're not uh, so. So four and five is the answer, but it's. Uh, <laughs> Let me see how much time I took to state the conjecture. A lot more than expected, but that's nice. Okay, evidence. So there's evidence of two types. Uh, there is a theorem that I'm going to state in a moment. And there is numerical evidence. So maybe let me start with the numerical evidence and do this quickly so I can focus on the theorem. So as I said, uh, these lists are finite, so you can compute them. And Kiran Ketlaya and Drew Sutherland, they've done this. And for Q equals 2, they've computed the list of all such L. And there's 50,000, as I said, about 50,000. Now you could say, OK, we have this list of 50,000 candidate L functions. All I have to do is find 50,000 K3 surfaces over F2 and match them. The only problem is, you, I mean, you, you can't write down all K3 surfaces over F2 because some of them are going to live in some P500 or so. And you, not all of them are complete intersections of low degree. So this is hopeless. You can never hope to find them. Uh, but what they did is they said, well, if I look at very special L, degree 20, very strong restrictions, very small discriminant, then you can prove that if they occur as a transcendental L function of some K3 surface over F2, then necessarily that must be a quartic surface. You can almost never prove from structure of the 
Picard uh, lattice, the, that, that the skate reserves has to be quartic, but in some very extreme cases, you can just do it. So they did this, made the list, and found the list of 1,995 L functions that should occur as the L function of a quartic A3 over F2. No, no, so that's absolutely not, there definitely are, that you're absolutely sure. But at least of these 1,995, you expect them to occur as a L function. You can test it then, you can expect them to occur. So then all you need to do is go through all the quartic K3 surfaces of F2, compute their zeta function, and see that all of them occur. Uh, you ask this to any person in computational number theory or computational geometry, and they will laugh at you. They will say you're crazy because it's there's two to the 19 approximately such surfaces. To compute your zeta function, you have to com count points over f 2 to the 11. Uh, you're still you're not over f, not just over uh, uh, even characteristic. You're just over f 2. F 2, absolutely. That over f 2, there is 1,995 such candidate things. So most of these. No, no, this is the order of magnitude. It's a close estimate. Yeah, but this is just, just one million, yes? Sorry? This is just one million. Yeah, this is just one million, but now it's, it becomes uh, one million times counting points over F2 to the 11 on a surface. If you ever try to count uh, points over F2 to the 11 on anything on a computer, you know this cannot be done. Uh, except that uh, Kedlaya and Sutherland, they're so good at these things that they still did it. In a massive computation full of smart tricks. So they made a list of all these things, computed all the zeta functions, and they found that all 1,995 do occur. Uh, quite surprisingly. So that's one piece of uh, evidence. Uh, some, something like generic function? Of course, you don't have any generic mm. uh, for finite number of pieces, but maybe I don't see any reason for that. Uh, well, and also they found that nothing more occurs. No, no, lots of things more more occur because there's. I just said that there is a small list of which you can show that if they occur, they must come from a quartic. But there's no way you can make a bijection. There's no way that you can see from the L function which there's no even only if. It's not that you can look at the L function and say, oh, this must be a quartic. Only in some very special cases can you do this. Let me move on and state a theorem. So this was numerical evidence, now some, somewhat more uh, theoretical. So a theorem, first of all, there is an assumption. Uh, assume, let me call it SSR, and this is pun unintended, uh, semi-stable reduction. And let me even not define it now, because I think Christian will do this anyway. No, property star or something in the lecture of Christian. Uh, let me just say that it's an assumption related to uh, birational geometry in dimension three, in mixed characteristic, and it's something like an analog and mixed characteristic of the existence of Kulikov models for K3 surfacing characteristic zero. But the precise statement and status will come in the very long seminar talk we're getting later. So assume this, and, that, uh, and let's assume that L satisfies properties 1 to 5. Then, well, then I cannot prove that L occurs, but I can appro prove it occurs after a finite field extension. So in other words, there exists an N and a K3 surface X over FQ to the N, such that the L function of X over FQ to the N is well, not L, but the thing you would expect if you base change from FQ to FQ to the N. So you have to raise all the eigenvalues to the power N. So it's product 1 minus alpha I to the N, T, where the alpha I's are, let's say, these ones. OK, dot, maybe let me stop a moment and ask if it's clear what the statement is. It's a, a condition on all K3 surfaces over periodic fields. They all, so it's a, it's a hypo, so it, it's stating every K3 surface over a periodic field has a good model. It's a conjecture. It's a conjecture, and it's a conjecture that's. Uh, it's essentially a potential semi-stable reduction, which everybody would expect. We do have currently in dimension three. I mean, we're talking about models of surfaces over, uh, over the axis of dimension three. We have. 
uh, would follow from the division of similarity plus some sort of choroidalization. Almost there. I mean, the experts, I mean, yes, there are also many cases where this is known, but it's currently not quite. So to, to rephrase this, uh, every time I ask an expert what they expect of this, uh, the answer you get is, oh, this is most definitely true, and wait a few years and then it will be a theorem. My expression, though, is that they have been saying this for a few years already, so... <laughs> This, no, 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 no. This is a condition on P. This is a conjecture from, say, resolution of singularities and mixed characteristic, essentially. It, it will, it come to the seminar and there will be a, there really will be, I presume, a precise statement of the condition. Right? Okay, so maybe I should, let me Let's keep the theorem on the board and let me give you a sketch of how it's proven. The time I've left, there's not much more that I can do than a sketch. Uh, okay, so... So here is how this goes. A sketch of the proof. Very rough sketch. So we are given some L which satisfies properties 1 to 5. And out of this, we actually have to construct a K3 surface. So how does this go? Well, first, you construct uh, a number field, a CM field, E uh, over Q, and an element pi in E uh, such that a number of properties hold. I think I can even still write this in this box, two things. First of all, the characteristic polynomials, polynomial of pi is the L you are given, right? The, the, so the characteristic polynomial of multiplication by pi in E. Uh, it has to be a CM field, and there should be a unique place V lying over P with V of pi less than zero. You can do this. This is. Uh, in, in, uh, this is elementary number theory almost, because somehow it's like weak approximation or Chinese remainder theorem. There, there's a condition that the field should be CM, but that's a condition at infinity. There is some p-adic condition that should be unique place with a certain property, but that's a condition at p. And well, to pr produce some number field in which uh, the characteristic polynomial of pi is L, you, well, you kind of know how to do this. You start by looking at the number field given by this irreducible polynomial Q, and maybe you make an extension. but. This is the easy part. Um, and then once you have this CM field E, you build a K3x over the complex numbers with CM uh, as defined yesterday with complex multiplication by the field E. And this part is tricky. Uh, there's two things you need. Well, so certainly the construction is going to be transcendental. It's going to use. Uh, the Torelli theorems, you're not really going to construct a K3 surface, but it's period, and then just use the surjectivity of the period map to say, oh, apparently there exists a K3 surface. So this part is highly non-constructive, and the proof of this theorem will be highly non-constructive. Uh, but in order to do this, you also need to prove something about uh, quadratic forms. Uh, there's something rather delicate to do, to do in case that the transcendental rank is very large. And to indicate this, uh, uh, Piatetsky, Shapiro, and Shafarevich already showed this when the degree, where is it, my 2D, is at most 16. Uh, in fact, with hardly any work, you can extend this to degree 18. But to prove it in degree 20, which is possible, it goes up to 20, you really need to do something new. So you really need to prove something on quadratic forms to do that. But once you've done it, you have your x. And now let's, I think I can finish on the board here. Uh, then you use CM theory. So yesterday, I told you that uh, the collection of K3 surfaces over the complex numbers with CM is countable and is kind of defined in an algebraic way. So therefore, they're all defined over Q bar. 
But CM theory is going to tell you something much more precise than that such a thing is defined over Q bar. It's going to actually give you an explicitly constructed number field over which it's defined and very uh, precise information. So in particular, um, it's going to give you the following. Let me see if I can write it down precisely. It's going to, so we had our field E. It's going to give you a finite extension F. Uh, so we had P and V over here and then a place W over there plus a model of x over f uh, such that the action of the absolute Galois group of f at the place w on h2 is unramified. All this you get out of, I say CM theory, but maybe the better thing to say is looking carefully uh, at the relevant Shimura varieties. Uh, classifying K3 surfaces. OK, but now this looks very hopeful. You have, just uh, think at first in terms of elliptic curves, you have an elliptic curve over some, uh, say, uh, finite extension of QP. You know that the action of Galois at that place is unramified. Then you have Neronok Shafarevich, and you know you have good reduction, so you can reduce and get an elliptic curve over a finite field. Luckily. Uh, Christian Lietke and uh, Yuya Matsumoto showed some kind of Neronok Shafarevich criterion for K3 surfaces. It's a bit more delicate, but I don't have to say anything about it because you'll get a talk about it uh, later today. Uh, and uh, using this, you can show that uh, X has good reduction. Well, maybe you need to extend your field. Let me ignore that. Let's write it. Potentially good reduction. And so you get uh, some x over some finite field. And then you really, well, you can do all this, but then you have to go through your entire construction again to check very carefully that the thing you produced is not just some random K3 surface, but is the K3 surface with your desired characteristic polynomial of Frobenius and not something completely unrelated. So let me also remark that this thing is where the semi-stable reduction uh, pops in. Uh, this result is conditional on a hypothesis that uh, I mentioned and more will be said about later. Questions about this very brief sketch of the proof? Okay, so a few things. Uh, as I said, so the result is weaker than the conjecture. The conjecture asked to do this over FQ itself and not over a finite extension. If you go through this proof, it's not just because of this potential good reduction, but basically in every step of the proof, there is an extension of the field hidden. So this strategy will never allow you to prove that you actually get an x over fq itself. In fact, the x that you produce typically will not be defined over fq. And you have the same problem if you try to, say, prove Honda Tate for abelian varieties. You, you, you do some general thing again. You first make a complex torus, and then Neron Shafarevich you reduce. But the abelian variety that you make will typically be isogenous to the one you want, but, not be, but itself will not be defined over FQ. So it will be some abelian variety over a bigger field, isogenous to the one over FQ that you want. Same thing here. The thing you produce, it will be isogenous in a certain sense to the thing you want, but it won't be the thing itself, so you can't hope to prove this one is defined over FQ. So, Wait, can you control this? Yeah? Uh, yes, but the control will, will be, let's say, of um, analytic number theory nature. But yeah, yeah, but, but I mean, so theoretically you could do this, but the bound will be in terms of, say, bounds on class numbers and things like that. It's not going to be pretty and it's not well, going to be small. But it will depend on, on L. And it, it, it will be huge. That, but that's the, the smallest of all. <laughs> yeah. But let me actually, I wanted to end with a question and not. Uh, yes, please. Uh, you have to construct, construct a CM field. And that, right? And that, that, yes. So, uh, good. So, so the problem kind of, if you now want to go further from FQ to the N to FQ, you need to be able to move around in an isogeny class. 
And Sergey explained how to do it for abelian varieties. For abelian varieties, it's very easy because to produce from one abelian variety an isogenous one, all I have to do is divide out by some subgroup. I have a geometric way of doing this. But with a K3 surface, I can't do this. I can't just divide out by a subgroup. So, ah, 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 you're running ahead. We're coming there. Um, so let me actually state a, a question. And let me actually state a theorem, but a theorem in characteristic zero, and then ask a question. Uh, theorem. So here is something fun. So let K, let, let K be now a, a field, let's say, of finite type. It's actually true without the consumption of finite type, but it's kind of silly then. It's not the correct statement in that case. Uh, and of characteristic zero. And let x over k be a k3 surface. So the theorem is going to produce isogenous k3 surfaces uh, in the following way. Assume you have a lattice in its h2, uh, with the property that it looks like it could come from the h2 of another k3 surface. So what do I want? I want this to be Gawa stable. And I want it to be unimodular for the cup product pairing. So then the theorem says there actually exists a K3 surface Y over K such that, well, uh, the H2 at primes different from L did not change. So H2 YZL is H2 K bar X, oh, I should not call it ZL, ZL prime, X K bar ZL prime for every L prime different from L. And at the prime, L left replaced this one by the lattice. Oh, I should have put QL here because, of course, a submodule of something unimodular cannot be unimodular itself. Um, so H2, Y, K bar, ZL is lambda. And these are isomorphisms as, say, lattices together with Galois action. OK. So this is kind of the analog to what Sergey said earlier, uh, the kind of trivial statement about moving from one abelian variety to another. This theorem is uh, a theorem in characteristic zero. Let me just sketch in three words the proof. Over the complex numbers, Torelli, Don. And then you look carefully at the Shimura varieties of K3 service to deduce from the fact that you know it over the complex numbers for all K3 service at the same time that you can actually prove it over, say, Q bar and even over Q. Yes, it is. So maybe I should. S so lambda is a Galois stable unimodular ZL lattice. Is this what was confusing? Of no, no, of rank twenty-two. So lattice of full rank of rank twenty-two, because it should be the H two, the integral H two. So, but, so the rational H two I'm not changing, but I'm saying I change the integral H two a bit, and then there is a new K three surface with that changed <laughs> integral H two. Right? That's the, the nature of the game. And that one is kind of the exogenous one, in, without saying ever defining what isogeny means here. Um, OK, so I gave this theorem. I sketched the proof by hand waving. So let me ask, end with the obvious question. And kind of if you cannot answer that question, it looks pretty hopeless to answer, to prove the conjecture I stated earlier. Sorry? No, no, it's, it's characteristic zero, so action of a very big Galois group. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, so question. Uh, well, can you do this in characteristic bigger than zero? You have to change the statement slightly at the prime, you, at the prime P, but let me do, don't do that now. Uh, I have absolutely no, yeah, any integral structure that uh, is not like ruled out for silly reasons. It has to be unimodular, and it's uh, so any integral structure uh, on a given on the given rational H two of a K three surface occurs as the integral structure of another one. So, um, 
the argument I just gave, you can't really extend to a po uh, positive characteristic for the following reason. So you do have the Shimura variety, and it does have a model over Z, but and you do have your modular space of K3 surfaces, and that has a model over Z. But over Q, you can kind of show these things are the same, and the models over Z, they really start diverging. The relation is very unclear, and it's, you can't just pass from knowing something about the Shimura variety does not tell you that much about uh, integral structures on the K3 side and vice versa. So that's the nature of the problem. Uh, and let me come back to one remark made. I only know of one technique that allows you to produce, actually produce kind of geometrically, uh, not using Torelli, an isogenous K3 surface from a given K3 surface, and that's modular spaces of sheaves on that given K3 surface. So the only kind of approach I know to doing such a thing is building moduli spaces of sheaves, but it seems like by far too little is really known, especially in positive characteristic, to make this work. Or even to kind of reprove this in characteristic zero with these techniques seems, well, let's say hard. Thank you for your attention. Sorry for going mm, not really over time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, questions? And thank you for your questions. Mm -hmm. This was much More better. Questions? Um, a priori, yes. Uh, so everything works similar except for Litka Matsumoto. It becomes much harder than to. Uh, yeah, yeah, because that really is a statement about three dimensional geometry. So you can't really hope at this moment to, to just have some Neron Okshafarevich criterion. But uh, for, for instance, uh, is there some kind of this of um, I hope so. Of this theorem, <coughs> I, 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 in characteristic zero, right? I, I see no immediate obstruction. I haven't thought about it, but I, I, see, I see no immediate obstruction. Sorry. Yeah, but but you but you still have a Torelli theorem that tells you exactly what lattices should occur. So you you have to change the statement a bit, but you have the information you need to do that. Well, all functions of Enrique surfaces are, are are very boring because everything is algebraic. There's only roots of runity. So in a way, they're very difficult. So I didn't say anything about this algebraic part because it's heavily combinatoric, combinatorial. All these techniques don't tell you anything about it. Uh, so it's, it's in a way much more difficult. And yeah, there is nothing transcendental. It's as difficult as the part that you missed here. Yeah, yeah. And doesn't the no? It's kind of orthogonal to that, right? Because the, at least certainly I can only tell you something about the transcendental part of the K3 cover which has no direct relation to the zeta function of the Enrique surface itself. So if it would help, you, you would have to tell something about the algebraic part because you Absolutely. Can't, which you wish yeah. to do in a way. Yeah. And the fact that uh, it's not another for K3, but the uh, 2 2 2 2 section does help also. So this is an interesting remark because in this whole story, if you, I mean, if I would have changed the question, and the question would have, the question would have been what are the zeta functions of quartic surfaces, it would have been hopeless. It's really because you take all degrees at the same time that you can say something. If you want to filter out those things that occur in a given, say, 2 to 2 in uh, uh, P5. And it, it, in your theorem about that there exists something over some extension, you never control the no. relation. No, you don't. And let me even tell you one more thing about it. So in the list that Kedlaya and Sutherland make of candidate L functions over F2, there is one of which we can prove that it cannot occur in dimension less than 500. So its, it, so it's smallest possible polarization is degree 560 or something. So you'll never, so even if you prove this theorem, you know it exists. We know, I mean, if you assume semi-stable reduction, you know it exists after finite extension, but you'll never be able to write it down in any explicit way. Now, but still, you are able to prove that something is not realized in the quartic and something is not realized in the yeah, 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 yeah. So in the negative direction, this is sometimes you can just show that there is no, not not even a vector in the Picard rank of the right length. The problem is that you you just is the other way around that you need to decide when 
an element of the Picard group is very ample. And that's very hard. Thank you. We need human five minutes. And I think I got five at some moment, I'm pretty sure. So it's, uh... But Christian has uh, another chance.